Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm Mark Hansen, the uh, British Heart Foundation professor at the university here and the director of the Institute of Developmental Sciences over the road. Um, and it's a very great pleasure to welcome you all here to uh, University Hospital Southampton to talk about building superhumans. Um, what I'm going to do is to talk just for about 15 minutes just to tell you something about the work that we do and kind of give you some of the background to why development in the Institute of Developmental Sciences is so important. And then I'll introduce Professor Lord uh, Winston. Uh, and he can introduce the panel and we can get cracking on our question time. So there's the institute uh, on the other side of the uh, piazza as it's called of the hospital on a nice sunny day and I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. Oh, that reminds me, if the, if the bells ring, we're not expecting a fire practice, so it's for real. So the exits, as they say on, you know, fly beer over there and here and there's a whistle to attract attention. Okay. If I asked you this question, what kills more than 70% of the population of the world, <clears throat> you might be forgiven for saying as a reflex, Whoa, well it's probably uh, cholera, it's probably HIV, it might be uh, smallpox, no we've already, and polio, no, it's, uh, um, um, hmm, tuberculosis. You'd think, wouldn't you, initially, especially if you just see TV uh, and newspaper coverage of diseases around the world, you'd think it was the communicable diseases, but the things you catch. But actually, what kills 70% of the world or more are non-communicable diseases. Cardiovascular disease, complications of diabetes, respiratory disease, some forms of cancer. And if you then add that to, add on to that, disabling diseases, osteoporosis, cognitive decline, mental illness and so on, this is a huge burden of disease. It's actually something that's only recently been recognised, particularly by the United Nations, who in 2011 said we have to do something about this. That's kind of funny, really, when you think they set up the Millennium Development Goals that we should be achieving in 2000, that it took them so long to realise that we should be doing something about the diseases that kill so many people. So the next question is then... What, why? And of course we live in a, an age of alternative facts, don't we now? So here's a fact or factoid that non-communicable disease risk is genetic predisposition plus bad adult lifestyle. And like all alternative facts, Trump tweets or whatever, there's a little bit of truth in it, but not enough to really build <coughs> a real medical research uh, institute on. Part of it then is genes, <clears throat> and there's no doubt that genes do play <coughs> a role <coughs> excuse me, in some rare genetic disorders. And the work that we're doing here in the, at the University of Southampton in the Faculty of Medicine uh, to understand the importance of genetic uh, origins of disease may well lead in the end to personalised medicine, the opportunity to customise treatments according to the genetic makeup of an individual and perhaps to avoid side effects. And it will help us to predict the risk of some of these nasty diseases. So we've launched very recently our involvement in what's called the 100,000 Genomes Project. The idea that now that you can sequence the human genome for less than $1,000, it would be possible to put together a very large population of people <clears throat> and find their genetic code and then to try and relate that to what happens to them later in life. The problem is that the risk <clears throat> actually conveyed by genes is relatively small. And this uh, nice news feature, which is actually quite old now from Nature in 2008, <clears throat> uh, really makes the point. And the, uh, the journalist writing it says, the case of missing heritability. When scientists opened up the human genome, they expected to find the genetic components of common traits and diseases, the things that I've been talking to you about. But they were nowhere to be seen. Where'd they gone? Well, look, there's a burglar leaving at the back. He's got... Actually, it's not that simple. The, for example, if we take diabetes and put all the known risk gene factors, all the bad genes we've inherited from mum and dad together, it accounts for maybe 5 or 6% of the risk of diabetes. So if we go to the hospital here and we find 100 people who have type 2 diabetes and we genotype them, we might find that 6 or so have got this combination of nasty genes. So why are the other 94% diabetics? 
Well, of course, then it's adult lifestyle, isn't it? <clears throat> Until recently, this guy held the world record, Daniel Lambert. He was the, uh, <clears throat> the jailer um, in, in Leicester Jail, and he weighed 52 stone, 335 kilograms. He died, as you might expect, in a pub, <clears throat> and they had to knock the wall down to get him out. So you'd say, well, obviously he was a lazy so-and-so and he was a glutton. But actually, we've got some good diary records for him. And it turns out he had a pretty active life. And in fact, he was not. He didn't overeat. So there's something else going on, even with this chap. And in fact, when I talk to my nutrition colleagues and ask them, so what would it take for me, who's perhaps a fifth of the weight of this lovely gentleman, to get like him... It would be, well, if you took on board a certain level of calories every day and you didn't metabolise them, you could build up that body weight. How many calories? Well, about half of that. So if as a teenager, like many of our students in the audience, I'd been eating a couple of fingers of Kit Kat a day which I didn't metabolise, probably now I'd be as big as Daniel Lambert. Well, actually, as a confession, I've been eating Kit Kat since I was a teenager, uh, every day or something equally nasty, and I'm not like him. So clearly there's something else predisposing him to that condition, and I'm lucky that I haven't got it. And that really leads us to what we've done in the Institute over the last 10 years. Today we've had a fantastic day of science. Some of you have been with us <clears throat> celebrating our achievements in understanding how it is that early development sets up our pathway, our trajectory, if you like, of risk across the life course. And we found that aspects of mother's body composition, uh, whether she's fat or thin, uh, start to influence the baby's development, actually even from the very moment of conception, Professor Winston's expertise, there's that little embryo just beginning to divide, going down the <coughs> fallopian tube, the mum doesn't know she's pregnant, the dad doesn't know he's going to be a father yet, but here it is being exposed to this incredible cocktail of gases and hormones and nutrients and possibly pollutants as well, which are going to change its development from that very moment and change the way that that baby will develop and actually how its life will play out. And of course, when you've got the little fetus there connected, if you like, to the internet via the umbilical cord, of course, there's an enormous amount of influence coming in from the mum and the outside environment. And of course, it doesn't stop when the baby is born and mum and dad interacting with the child, of course, go on. And so we begin to get the trajectory of disease risk. We mustn't forget, of course, the dads do play a role in this. This poster, which I rather like, was actually from my misspent youth in the 1960s, and it was really designed to prevent, to, to encourage young men uh, like me as I was then to use contraception. Um, never mind about that. Um, but actually, uh, in many ways, it's still very, very appropriate to our research today because we find that actually, whether the dad is fat or thin, his diet, whether he smokes, how much he drinks, how much exercise he gets, can all affect some very early developmental processes in the developing embryo and then the fetus. And it all focuses around this single word here, epigenetics, a new branch of science which shows how the genes that we inherit uh, from mum and dad go on from that single cell, the zygote, the fertilised egg, of course, to become all the different cell types of the body, bone and muscle and teeth and skin and liver and so on. But equally, how those... So you can make all these different organs from the same genetic material, but equally how environmental influences can tweak those different switches, if you like, and change the destiny, the development of the baby, and perhaps then their risk of these later diseases that I'm talking about. And you know it's important when you see it on the cover of Time magazine, this is quite old now, why your DNA isn't your destiny. The new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. So this, of course, affects generation after generation after generation. But unlike genetics, which is, if you like, deterministic, possibly fatalistic, there's an opportunity perhaps to reverse or prevent these epigenetic changes and so to change the future. I really am so pleased that we've got um, some of our students from several Southampton schools. I hope you enjoyed your visit to the Institute, meeting our scientists and beginning to shape some of the questions that you're going to put to Lord Robert's panel um, uh, 
in a few minutes. We've got just a few uh, pictures there. So even uh, some of our staff were impressed by your enthusiasm uh, and the questions that you asked. And we want to do this every year from now on. It's been, I think, so uh, successful. One of the things that we're very proud about, and you may have heard of it, is Life Lab. It's a facility that we set up actually in the hospital here, just one floor up, where we've set up a designated customised classroom and we bring kids in from Southampton and Hampshire schools to experience the science that we do and to try to talk to us about the things that I'm talking to you about, how their lives may be influenced by their behaviour and lifestyle now and how that may go on to affect not only their future but the future of their children, me, my health and my children's health. And actually we've had, I think, more than 6,500 students through Life Lab now, and they love it. Um, the teachers love it too, I'm glad to say, because we're able to help them with material to set up the course. And it's something that we're now being encouraged to roll out uh, across the country uh, and even internationally. So Southampton is really putting a new approach to this problem uh, of lifestyle and later disease uh, on the map. And, of course, we've got some great friends. This is Lord Robert visiting Life Lab. I can't remember when this was, Robert. I can see Yorick in the background. He certainly thinks whatever it is you're saying is a very, very humorous. But we don't quite know. Uh, it's probably something terribly scatological. I don't know. So um, we developed this slogan. And here it is actually uh, in mock-up form uh, on the front uh, of the, uh, before it was installed on the IDS. And here is the front of the Institute of Developmental Sciences. Actually, um, I've got a bit of a confession to make to you that to a degree you've been brought here under false pretenses. Because in fact the Institute of Developmental Sciences is not 10 years old, it's 11 years old. And um, it was uh, completed by the, uh, the builders and we were beginning to get the keys ready to take, occupy the building um, here in the late summer 2006 and we thought we'd probably move in over Christmas uh, but we might start moving some kit in in late November. Um, so um, the builders decided well if we're moving in uh, and it's getting a bit cold probably a good idea to test the heating which they did they turned it all on and we all went home for the night following morning when we came in the building was flooded and more than half a million quid's worth of damage was done. As always in life when you look back on things you realise that you could have been smarter. Let's just take a little look at this building. Look at this particular architectural feature. What other thing can you think of that was launched in Southampton <laughs> that has four funnels and had a spot of bother with water? Yes. <clears throat> Long live the White Star Line. So I did think we should christen it, Dean, uh, the uh, Titanic Institute, but that was perhaps in poor taste. <clears throat> Uh, so I actually had the unfortunate thing of having to write to the uh, palace to uh, let the princess, uh, to Princess Anne, um, <clears throat> Princess Royal, know that even if she brought her wellies or her waders, she, it would not be possible for her to be able to open the building. Uh, and it wasn't until September uh, 20, uh, 2007 that it was uh, formally opened. So developing healthy lives... I promised you a film. We don't have a film. What we have is a YouTube clip, and I'd like to show it to you because if you like it, then obviously, Dr Green, we can circulate it, can't we? And perhaps it'll go viral. And hopefully it will play. When you look at life, do you look forward to a long, healthy future or back to your health in the past? What is the secret of a long and healthy life? Could the secret of a healthy life lie in our lives when we are young, even before we are born, affecting our whole life course? From the moment of fertilization, the unique set of genes inherited from parents are influenced by the environment, mother's lifestyle, and health. All these factors contribute to the environment of the fetus and influence how the baby's organs develop into early childhood. Very early events set up our later life health. This can be handed from one generation to the next. 
At the Institute of Developmental Sciences at the University of Southampton, we're bringing together the world's leading scientists to explore every stage of life. We've got some big questions about the sequences of genes to understand rare diseases, the influence of nutrition right across the life course, the way the placenta transports nutrients, how nutrition epigenetically alters DNA and genes to shape an individual's development, how the early embryo and fetus respond to the mother's diet and set up responses in later life, the potential of stem cells to regenerate and heal parts of the aging body, our close colleagues across the university and hospital help to shape our big questions and to turn the science back into ways to improve health for everyone. Developing healthy lives. So welcome again. Uh, I hope you enjoy the evening. It's a very great honour and pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Lord Robert Winston to introduce our panel. Robert, over to you. <laughs> are we going to have the two ladies, two ladies together, are we? All right, OK. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And uh, it's very uh, good to have such a wonderful panel, panel with us. And on my extreme left is uh, Professor Nina Modi, who's a colleague of mine at Imperial College and uh, an ex-president of the of the um, uh, of, of the sorry sorry are you still current I, I, <laughs> how long have you been president for clearly too long um, I'm, I'm sure I had a meal at your place ages ago and you were president <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you... Not at all. Yeah, anyhow, Not at all. anyhow, basically, Nina is, is um, a, a, a neonatologist in a, a, in a very, very important uh, uh, unit which has done a huge amount of work in developing neonatal science. Next to her is Shelley Rubman, who I'm disappointed to see doesn't have quite the shoulders I expected. <laughs> um, but Nina, uh, Nina um, is a medalist at that dreadful event uh, and it's wonderful to, to meet you, actually. Um, the, the skeleton bomb. Um, and I don't know, how many, how many medals have you won? Do you, do you remember? Um, quite a few in this sport yes. throughout all of the, yeah. the series. Yeah. Yeah, quite You're a too few. modest to say, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, it's very nice to have you Thank here. Thank you. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's physique to what goes into the physique, <laughs> really. Um, and of course, you can probably see that Jamie Raftery is, is, um, is obviously a chef. And uh, Jamie has worked at the, the French library. Uh, laundry. Laundry, yeah. laundry, which I've eaten in a couple of times in the Napa Valley. And he's been trained with some of the very best chefs in, in the world, people like Heston Blumenthal and Gordon Ramsay. And it's very nice to meet you too. Uh, you. So really, really lovely. So obviously, you're going to tell us about some aspects of the healthy intake, we hope. And, and finally, somebody who I don't know at all, uh, <laughs> uh, Adam Rutherford, of course, who you know very well, I'm sure, who is, I think it's fair to say, in my view, um, one of the most um, clear-thinking people who communicates science, um, mostly on the radio at the moment, really, but also on television, and of course has written a number of books, particularly on genetics. And it's a pleasure to see you this evening, Adam. Um, we've been on panels together before, sometimes in slightly odd circumstances, yes, I think you may true. remember <laughs> one of them. And I'll tell you what happened to that chairman at some point. But that's a, that's, I wasn't cheering it. Professor. Anyway, I'm going to start, if I may, with the first question, which comes from uh, Anna Stedman. Uh, Anna, where are you? And do you have a microphone? Fantastic. Can we get the microphone to you so that we can all hear the question? And do you mind standing up when you... Thank you so much. Um, what are the panel's views on what a superhuman is? Well, I think, I think actually, uh, that's a... <laughs> i tell you the truth, I was looking at you, Kelly. I think it's a wonderful question to ask. Because 
in a sense, uh, you are a superhuman in the thing that you do. Mm -hmm. And so your take on superhumanity would be very interesting. I think there's quite a lot of different takes on it, uh, whether you're academically superhuman or physically superhuman. Um, each is an individual. You, you push yourself within your field to become the best and get the best out of your body. Uh, within sport, you are going over the top of what you were, were born with because you go to the gym, you're trying to change your physique, you're trying to change your, your mind, and it, it, it's, a, it's a whole uh, period of, of between 10 to 20 years to, to evolve yourself as that person become super within your sport and within your, your field as well. I don't want to interrupt you, but I do need to ask you one question. Are you born or are you made? I think there's a mixture. I do think there is a mixture. It's really hard to... I've had this debate with many, many people and just recently as well. Um, I have so many traits from both parents, but at the same time, I'm completely different as well. So you kind of look at your parents and think, yeah, I definitely like them, but they wouldn't do what I did. <laughs> Adam? Well, I think, I think um, Shelley's got it exactly right. It's a bit of both. It's the old... Uh, we used to say um, nature versus nurture. We now, we've kind of abandoned that phrase within genetics. And a better way of phrasing it is nature via nurture. Um, but uh, Shelley points out that you, you not only inherit your genome from both parents, but you also inherit their environment too. So you, you inherit behaviours which are not determined biologically. And many of those things will be part of your makeup that makes you, you know, an enormous success at, at whatever you do. So it's, it's that age-old conflict between, um, or, well, not conflict, it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the, your DNA, which is your nature, and everything else, which is nurture. And it's the interaction between those two which makes us what we are. Nina, can I come to you? Because uh, as a neonatologist, you're dealing with the brain essentially when it's at its most plastic, mm -hmm. most easily damaged and so on. Um, what about neurological development? I'd, I'd, I'd add to the, the, the comments that have been made by saying that it's, it's, it's sure it's nature. We're born with an endowment. What we do with that endowment is the nurture. But there's an in-between as well. And the in-between is what we're exposed to that is not in our gift to influence. So, for example, Robert, as you say, a baby in utero has little control, if any, over what he or she is exposed to. It's in the gift of his mother and, to some extent, his father. But then, as we grow up, that becomes our responsibility. And it's, it's for us to shape uh, nurture um, and to nurture ourselves. So I would say there's a third element to that. And this, we, we, are, we are bequeathed a gift of DNA from our parents, but we're also bequeathed this gift of the first environmental influences, the first nurturing. And then gradually, as every parent does, they gradually relinquish that control and we take it over for ourselves. So Jamie, you've been called the holistic chef. Um, so, tell us about what you see as healthy food and how that may influence people in general and what they do and how they develop. Yeah, I think um, healthy food, I don't even like to use the term healthy, it's more like food. And the difference between food and, and fake food, there is these two comparisons. That, um, and I have a basket over here as well, I'll show you later. But, Food, for me, for, for food is actually food that comes from the earth, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, um, all these stuff that we get our, our energy from, from the sun to the earth. From seed, first of all, the energy from the sun to the earth to this plant, and then we eat it and that energizes us. Um, and then there's the food that's made in factories, highly processed foods, which um, actually drain our energy and sap our life force, I believe. So it's, um, we can call it healthy food, but 
real food that comes from the earth, plant-based foods, is what I believe we need to be, to be superhuman, to feel human. And what do you think is a, bal a balanced diet then? A balanced, each one of us here is very individual, we all have our own <coughs> unique personality. Is it each, the same um, for everybody? Uh, no, it's not the same for everybody. Everyone has a different relationship with food, a different gene structure, different habits from when we were growing up as kids. We have all a different, very, a different relationship with food, each so unique, like our fingerprint. Um, so a balanced diet is something we all have to figure out for ourselves and like, what we're eating, how we feel after it. Um, so, Anna, are you still at the microphone? Have you? Good. Um, have they answered your question? Um, yes. <laughs> you can throw it at them if you want to. Okay. All right. Has anybody got any very pertinent things to say about superhumanity? Because, of course, one of the things now, of course, is that with recent advances in gene insertion, which, of course, is something which is very much what's going on in my lab, uh, we should be able to make somebody who's not entirely human, which is an interesting question. Does anybody have any things to add to the question? If not, we'll move on, because I think that theme will come back in, in the questions. OK, so our next question um, is... Uh, I hope I've got your pronunciation right. Asiya uh, Muhammad, is that right? Asiya, are you around? Lovely. Can you, do you mind standing up? That's not too embarrassing. Um, so we can see you. Oh. Thank you. Can anyone become an Olympian or is it nature rather than nurture? Can anybody... Become an Olympian? Right. This um, is, that's a really good question. Well, it's I'm not going to put it to you for that reason. <laughs> you can't. You're over <laughs> <laughs> You've got to. <laughs> <laughs> Be the only one I can answer. No, I think, <laughs> no, I think, I think we'll start with Adam. Okay. Well, let's put him on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Because sure. then you can correct him, you see. And he, he doesn't well. like being corrected, so it's great. <laughs> no, all, as all scientists, they love to be corrected. Well, at least on paper. Um, the question was can anyone be an Olympian? Well, nature and nurture, we touched on it in the first answer, um, in the answer to the first question. And it's a very complex question. I think, I think the simple answer is no. Um, and it, but it kind of depends on what sport you're talking about. Because mostly at the Olympics, we are seeing, in, in many sports, we are seeing people who are freakishly unusual. Now, they are freakishly unusual <laughs> genetically. <laughs> Sorry, I'm averting <laughs> Shelley's <Be careful. laughs> eye contact at this point. She's now, there, it, so if you take four examples, a very interesting underlying Kenyan story to, 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 <laughs> to... If we take the 100 metres, right? So 100 metre sprints, um, a, a measure of the fastest humans on Earth. Over a specific distance, but, it, but the fastest at, um, at any measurable speed within the context of sport. Now... Uh, this, this is a, this is a qu question that I've written a lot about in my last book, but also it relates very specifically to the question of race. So I don't want to divert the conversation in, in, in that direction. But if you look genetically at all of the men and women who've been 100 metres uh, finalists in the Olympics for the last... Uh, well, since 1980, they've all been um, men in the men's um, of recent African origin. Now, this often comes up when you write about genetics and race, as I do, um, with many people from, the, from actual Nazis, people who describe themselves as Nazis, all the way to normal human beings, but often expressing the view, well, obviously, if all of the men who've been in the 100 metres final since 1980 have been black, then there must be a, a genetic association between being black and being a, a fast runner. Now, it isn't true. It, it, the first bit of that is true, that, that uh, the, the, the numbers of black men in the, in the 100 metres final has, has been consistent for, for more than 40 years now. Um, but the association is not to do with the skin colour, it is to do with the association with the fact that they've already been selected to be incredibly fast runners. There isn't an association between skin colour and speed, um, or, or even the types of muscle tissue 
that sprinters have, but you have already selected through the process of sport and social and culture and training and the environment in which they've been raised, you've already selected the very best sprinters on, on Earth. Now, if the question is, can anyone be a really decent uh, sort of mid-range footballer, then I think the answer is probably yes. If they are, if they are sort of averagely, uh, genetically average, but are in an environment where that is uh, championed and, and that they have parental uh, support and social support and, and school-based support and they have the <laughs> facilities. You know, the strongest association between success in table tennis is not even being... Um, from one town, but, but from being one in one street in, I think it's Bradford. Was it Bradford or Leicester? But almost all champion table tennis players in this country have, have, come, have lived on one street. Now, they probably are a bit more genetically related to each other than, than any, anywhere else in the country. But it's quite clear that in order to get to that tier, um, then uh, the your environment is probably more important than your genetics. I would, but, ask, I but, would ask you what mutations they've got. I think we're, <laughs> I'm going to come back to do, that in just do a this. second, if I may. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, can, can, let's, let's move on, because, I mean, when I, I remember, remember when I was, you know, a student, uh, the people who really watched their diet were the people who were rowing. They, they were massively involved with actually what they ate. So tell us a little bit about that in terms of the Olympian athlete. Yeah, um... With diet relating to to performance, athletes. performance, yeah. Well, it's, I think it's the key part. Key everything we eat becomes our skin, our hair, our energy, our everything. So, what we put in our bodies is obviously going to have a massive, massive impact on on our performance, on our mental performance, on our on our everything. I mean, really. do you do you end up eating more protein, for example, to develop muscle? Is that d necessary? D it depends on the. On the category, on the type of sport, I guess. Uh, um, complex carbohydrates, I would. Well, there are some rugby players in the audience because yeah. I've met them earlier. They're really burly. Yeah. And there's, there's a second row, it's there's a first row yeah. forward. I've done so. a lot of CrossFit in the last two years, and rather than focusing on protein, I'm more looking at complex carbohydrates, which is a bit more energizing, like brown rice and buckwheat and grains that sort of sustain energy as well as, as, well as protein. I think in the media now, it's very much about selling protein. Um, I think it should be more about you know, a balance of complex carbohydrates, fats, protein. And, um, I think Shelley is beginning to see which way the discussion is going. Shelley, what about you? What about your sport? Because you have to build up particular muscles too. We do. Um, for the skeleton bobsleigh, um, <clears throat> when I was doing it from the beginning, it was more, you, you had to be, resemble more of an athlete, uh, quite slim, um, explosive, um, but quite aerodynamic on the sled. Uh, over the past, uh, maybe last five years, there's been a huge change in the skeleton sport. So, uh, in particular, the females, they're bulking up and they're becoming much more powerful now. They're going for um, more muscle bulk and weight over being slim and aerodynamic purely because of the momentum of the sport to get a gain because it's, it's proven now that if you um, can add uh, every kilogram to a lighter athlete, you can get down that track making errors, but the momentum will kind of override those errors. So that's the focus of the sport. But also, the sprint start is becoming so critical to our sport as well that the more powerful and the more robust you can become. This, this audience will be, I think, very interested in what's going on Mentally. Up here, yeah. tell us about that. Depends what happens on the run. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, yeah. you know, competitive sports have something in common, yeah. don't they? They do. So you have to be completely switched on as soon as, as that green light for us or, or the, the start gun goes. But prior to that, you do so much mental preparation that you almost get on that start line and you think, I've, I've done everything now. And it almost it, it plays out automatically. Everything's just just happening, and you don't need to think about your technique. You just do it because all of those hours in the gym, the hours with sports psychologists, that preparation has been done. And when you race, you, you are literally racing. I, 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 mean, I remember being terrified trying to 
toboggan. Uh, you know, there's a place in Switzerland, St. Morris, where that yeah. happens. And, and I, I mean, what about that aspect? Did you feel, do you feel frightened when you're going down? Or how do you, how do you avoid feeling fear? Because that can't help your performance. No, to begin with, you do feel fear and it, it, it does sometimes stay with you until you become uh, familiar with the track and you know that there are certain corners where they're, they're no longer a, a fear because you can execute the steers throughout that curve um, properly. So when we actually uh, race on a skeleton sled, we twist it torsionally with our body strength, so our core has to be really strong. But also we uh, manipulate the pressures in the... Um, the g-force going down the track to kind of create a central fugal force to spit you out of those curves so if you kind of gain too much height or if you go into a curve at a certain angle then obviously then the sequence of lines can affect each curve from thereafter and you lose time so we have to learn the the steers we have to try and um, you know almost be engineers within the sport to understand the pressure points and, and the curvatures. So you have to have a whole mix of... Just tell the audience, what's your top speed? Um, 84 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've gone, um, some have gone quicker. <coughs> and have you gone over the top at all? No, Cresta you would do, but in our sport, no, you mm. wouldn't. You could roll out of curves. So if you, mm. you come out of an exit of a curve, sometimes you can, what we call is drop a runner, yeah. where the pressure comes off and you, yeah. you corkscrew yeah. out. Yeah. But not too often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Nina, what, what enlightenment have you got about, about this aspect of...? Well, I'm going to ask the audience a question, if I may, and that is to say, how many of you like Brussels sprouts? And how many of you don't like them? <clears throat> OK, there we go. Now, what makes the difference that there? And it may well be whether or not your mum ate Brussels sprouts when she was pregnant. Um, there's... Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there is, there's a certain amount of evidence that suggests that, uh, again, your, your, a baby's tastes are entrained when they're still in the womb, when they're still in, in utero. And it's another example of how the ways in which these messages between mother and baby can be transmitted in ways that actually we don't stop to consider in day-to-day -day life. Wasn't there, wasn't there a US president who, who was famous for saying he hated... It was broccoli, wasn't it? Mm. Wasn't it George Bush who hated broccoli? Isn't that right? And whenever I, whenever I, I read that quote, I thought, hmm, well, Mrs Bush should have met a really good chef who yeah, knew how to cook delicious cook nicely. broccoli. Yeah. I do, I like that. Sorry to interrupt, but no, no, I, no, I like no, that, that's your meant to. That challenge of... Um, some people have built up in their mind that they don't like something. Um, it might be from a bad experience. The Brussels spouse might have got burnt at Christmas, or they might have had a bad experience with mushrooms. And they, you hold on to people hold on to that negative emotion and go through their life thinking, "Oh, I don't like beetroot, or I don't like <laughs> mushrooms." And I, I love that challenge because I'll do a blindfold test, That's or so I'll true. cook mushrooms, or I'll make a beetroot and pineapple juice, or, or whatever, and let them taste it, and they enjoy it, and it's it's like a revelation. Um, it's quite empowering for people as well to, to actually find out that they enjoy something that they thought they didn't like. But, but mushrooms don't make you an incredible athlete, do they? Uh, it, not, not any one thing makes you an incredible athlete or an incredible superhuman. It's a combination of, um, of, of, of a variety of foods. I'd like to come back to Adam, because Adam, just remind us about these strange families in parts of Kenya who live at relatively high altitude mm. and clearly have a genetic, uh, a shown genetic tendency apparently to run long distance for very long t periods of time. Yeah, that's, that's right. So there are certain g adaptations which are genetic in their basis, um, uh, so purely biological, um, which, for example, in, this, in, your, in the example you give, predispose people to be, being better at processing uh, low oxygen at altitude, and so we see them in places in Kenya and East Africa, also in the um, uh, Ethiopian highlands, also in Morocco, and also in Tibet. Now, this is, I think this is a great example of how there is a biological basis to being predisposed to being better at, for example, a sport. Um, but it's a great example because we have seen championship Olympic Olympically successful runners from Morocco, Kenya, um, East Africa, Ethiopia in general. You also see exactly the same mutation in the people of Tibet and the Dutch. 
Now, these are two countries that are not typically associated with Olympic success at long distance running. But I think that that perfectly demonstrates that it isn't just the genetics. Having the genetics, having that particular allele, that, that version of that gene which makes you better at processing oxygen at height is part of that process. But if long distance running isn't part of your culture, as it isn't in Tibet and as it isn't in the Netherlands, then it's that you're not going to be in a culture that raises Olympic standard um, athletes. So again, it goes back to it's, it's both. You, you, to be at the very top of your game, which is Olympic level, they, these people probably already have unusual genetic bases, but they have to have gone through a social and cultural structure which pushes them to be um, superhuman. I, 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 I mean, we could go on for a very long time on this uh, amazing subject, um, but I, I, I'd still want to tease this out with you about the brain, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, chairmen who go on on their own hobby horses are very irritating <laughs> audiences, so I don't want to give my own views, but there are studies, for example, with musicians, Kleber's work, for example, which shows... Does anybody here play grade 8 piano or grade 8 violin? Anybody? Hands up? OK. Well, interestingly, you've, you will have recruited more neurons in your, in your, in your motor cortex than, than average, and that could be shown on scanning so, uh, for your little finger and your ring finger. Um, so, in fact, that's an example of where the brain can adapt to extensive and repeated yeah. exercise. Do you think that happens with athletes? I mean, I don't yeah. think it's ever been looked at. I'm not sure that people have done that sort of neuroscience. With regards to them playing music? As no, 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 in regard, regard to them actually, from them actually doing, the sport doing something yeah, at a very, very high level. Gymnastics, for example. Yeah, um, from all different angles. Um, I mean, from doing my sport, I, I can process information so fast. I can see peripherally really, really well. I can see you now. <laughs> I can, um, no, I can't. It's just, uh, just from doing the sport for 13 years, my um, processing of information is so, so fast. And when I'm doing a run on the track, I have to, um, you know, execute maybe four steers uh, within... Um, three hundredths of a second, but I know I'm doing those steers, but also I'll visually, I'll see people on the track. Uh, I'll think, oh, what am I having for, for dinner as I'm going down this run? It's <laughs> unreal. It's really weird. It, it, it's very true. You speak to quite a lot of the athletes and they will say, I saw a uh, coach there, but at the same time, they're thinking, how did that run go? Oh, that, you know, I didn't execute that steer right. Um, and I think you do develop, do develop. Asiya, have you still got the microphone? Great. Do you want to stand up and make any comments yourself, or are you too embarrassed to do that? Um, no, it's OK. Are, are you happy with the answers? Oh, yeah. Does anybody else want to chip in very quickly, very briefly? Yes. Could I just say something to follow up on your mentioning Brussels sprites? Because I'm just sitting here thinking... I'm following up on the Brussels sprite comment. <laughs> Most people in the UK eat Brussels sprites at Christmas and wouldn't it be interesting to see if babies born in October and November this is only semi-flippant if babies born in October and November didn't like Brussels oh. sprites there's a PhD in this somewhere as those <laughs> at other times of the year did no your, your theory is completely wrong I, I was, bo was, I was born, born in July and I love Brussels sprouts <laughs> <laughs> I, I eat them every Friday night oh. Um, but then I was a war baby. I mean, I was born in 1940, and I suppose at that time, of course, Brussels sprouts were very much on the menu because there weren't a large number of green vegetables that we ate, I suppose. So perhaps my mother's environment was important in my... I don't know. <laughs> Mind you, I don't think my sister liked Brussels sprouts, and she was oh. born at the end of the war. And it was too. <laughs> All right. So we better, we better move on. Um, Sophie Willis, where are you? Sophie, do you want to get the microphone and ask your question? Um, we all need a healthy diet, but how does the panel think we determine what healthy means for an individual person? So let's start with you, Nina, because you're a paediatrician where diet becomes massively important. Mm. 
So the first step is a pretty difficult one because you've got to teach your mum to have a good diet. Not quite sure how you do that, but that's, the, that's absolutely the, the first step given that the previous comments about broccoli and Brussels, Brussels sprouts. But then there's also very, there's very, you know, really very important, but probably very little known research that really does show that you can, you can um, entrain a child's, a, an infant's tastes. So if you, if you, if you, and some, some beautiful experiments where little children were, uh, were given, first of all, a choice of what, you know, every, anything they wanted to eat. So lots of little kids, party food laid out before them. They can have whatever they want and how much of they, they want. Of course, they'll all go for, you know, the Smarties and the sweets and the, the stuff like that. But if you do that every day, um, and also on another table, you've got another selection of foods, you know, the sprouts, the broccoli, the carrots, the, the cucumber, what, what, whatever. Um, after a while, they'll actually, they will, of their own volition, stop going towards the, the sweets and start going to other things. And uh, if you go even back further in time, babies can self-regulate their own intake. It's one of the wonderful things about breastfeeding, a baby breastfeeding at the breast, is that uh, that baby will, will, will balance what they take very, very nicely indeed. And mums very often say, well, I don't know how much my baby's feeding. And the answer to that is, you don't want to know, you don't need to know, just trust your baby. So babies can self-regulate their intake. Little children, if left to their own devices, will choose a balanced diet. They'll have a bit of this, a bit of that, and a bit of the other, and they won't just go at one thing. But one of the, the mistakes we find that parents tend to make is that if they see their child likes something, they will tend to give them more of that and less of the other. And gradually that child's taste sensations will become directed towards that. So the best advice I think one can give parents of, of, of young children <coughs> is give them a full range of tastes and flavours and textual sensations in their mouth and make sure that they they, they've recognised, they've met all of these sensations, and they will grow up having a healthy diet. My, uh, my five-year-old grandchild, Sophie, uh, when she was five anyway, was a strict vegetarian, her mother's a vegetarian, and I, she was staying with me one evening and I said, I'm going to have asparagus for dinner. And she said, you can't have asparagus, you're not a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, tell, tell us about what you do in, when you're doing in training. What, what, how do you? Because most athletes are pretty careful about what they eat, aren't they? Yeah, they are. It, it all depends on whether you gain weight really easily or whether you lose it. And because of the the cold climate, quite a lot of athletes do burn a lot of energy trying to keep warm. Um, and then obviously some. Um, not as much as others. So it all depends on the individual. For me, I was on a high calorie um, intake of, of foods just purely because my metabolism was. Did you uh, change the calories before an event? Um, a little bit. Um, I would have uh, porridge for breakfast just so it would sustain throughout the day um, a, a, a degree of protein in there as well. But it all depended on what was going on and what the race time was. Um, I'd always refuel straight after. For me, I had to have something constantly because I get hungry quite quickly. Um, but also, like I said previously, because of the cold elements, you're, you're burning just to try and stay warm as well. Um, so you, you have to have uh, like quick food on the go, which is why we would take like protein bars with us. I'm not a huge fan of taking protein shakes and, and all of those likes. I try and get the food intake through eating good meals. I'm not fatty either. Uh, I think there's a, a real hard thing um, now where there's just information coming at you all the time. Mm. Don't have sugar, don't have fats, mm. don't use these. And it's almost uh, an education where you need to just be rounded and just mm. go, do you know what, as long as I eat, and I tell my clients this, because I train personal training, um, don't be fatty, just just eat the right foods, eat good meals, get loads of greens in, good proteins, carbs as well. Don't eradicate the carbs. Um, I, 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 you know, and you just be balanced and, and it's a common sense, really, but don't eradicate a food group. Jamie, have you ever um, 
fed athletes? Um, specifically, I'd, I've done CrossFit for three years, so I kind of consider myself an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Powered by plants. Um, I actually, over my three years as CrossFit, I came, I've came, I came 70th in Europe um, last year in the scaled CrossFit. Um, and throughout them three years, I, I was on a plant-based diet, which is free from animal products. And my performance in, in, in the CrossFit gym has started overtaking all these other strong athletes who might be well built, but put it down to running and like where you need a lot of um, stamina. Well, that's where I'd be like passing them out. Um, so I sort of use my own body as a as a kind of um, how would you say experiment to see how I react because I don't like telling people what they should and shouldn't eat and what's healthy unless I believe unless I feel the benefits myself. So I would highly recommend a whole food plant based diet for a healthy for a healthy diet. Um, lots of variety. Uh, variety in different colours, red cabbage, beetroot, greens, um, uh, all the colours of the rainbow and then through getting all the different coloured vegetables you're naturally getting all the different vitamins and nutrients and, and so on. So you don't need to worry about calorie counting or what's in broccoli and what's in cabbage and have I got enough magnesium and have I got this because it is very, can become very convoluted and, and complicated reading different labels and so on. So to simplify it I'd say um, a variety of different colours, mainly from plants. Adam, Adam, you probably like me have stared at the back of buses <laughs> and seen the adverts well, endorsed by some of our greatest cricketers. Mm. Um, and I wonder whether you might have a word to say about the trace compounds that we have a fad for now. Oh, yeah, I do. I do have words to say about this. <laughs> I have strong thoughts on these. This, this is a subject, as, as you know and won't be surprised. I, I mean, I, just, I, I rely on evidence, and as a scientist, one has to, has to look at what the data says. And the data says very clearly that no diet works, right? That is, that is the best evidence we have on dietary fads. The best predictor of gaining weight over a five-year period is people who start diets. Right? So, based on that, all diets make you fatter. Okay. That's, the, that's the first thing. Um, what Shelley was saying is exactly right. Um, we know that no fad diets work. We know that if you, take, if you do the 5-2 diet, then you're eating five-sevenths of your normal calorific intake, so you will lose weight. If you cut, cut out carbohydrates or cut out sugar, what it, the effect that it has, the short-term dietary effect that it has is that it makes you care about food more, it makes you think about what you're eating more, and makes you probably eat less. But, as I said, over the long term, it will result in you being heavier than you were when you started the diet. What Shelley said is right, a balanced diet. You need all... The body is much smarter than we give it credit for. You do not need to take dietary supplements unless you, you're taking folic acid when, you need to, when, you, when you're trying to get pregnant or specific things like that. Almost all vitamins are a waste of money. They either don't work, are not stored by the body, or um, have no effect on the body. Taking extra vitamin C is almost always a waste of, <laughs> of money because we do not retain vitamin C. And if you have more than you take... The vitamin C, the, your daily intake of vitamin C is provided by either an apple or a packet of crisps. Anything more than that, you will piss out. A <laughs> packet of crisps has, has as much vitamin C as an apple. Sophie, what it. are your comments? Uh, I don't have any. Can't hear you. I don't have any. You don't have any? <laughs> I tell you what. You're, are you, know, you stunned into silence or <laughs> appalled? Or appalled? Information that we need to time, time for one quick comment from the audience. Anybody? Yes. The chap over there with the glasses. Thank you. Uh, what does the panel think about uh, the times that you should eat? Because you can talk to uh, one GP and they'll say you should snack at certain times, you should be doing, uh, eating in small amounts. Um, but then you may speak to, I've spoken to dentists who say you should drink, uh, you should eat uh, three meals to reduce your, uh, your sugar levels in your mouth. What does the panel think of that? And what's the evidence? Well, it's mixed. It's, it's very mixed, and I think you have to find out what works for you. And if you do think that you've got a, a big slump after a very heavy meal, then maybe eat less. 
at that, at, at that time, unless you want to have a big slump in the evening, which some people want to do. I think um, uh, eating, some people say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, it's not, right? It, you, you need to work out what works for you. Don't feel obliged to eat a big breakfast and then skip snacking at 11 or, having, or skipping lunch. The rules are very simple. Eat less, eat more vegetables. That's pretty much it. If you do that, you'll be healthier. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to um, Anjana Lakshmi um, <coughs> Narasimhan. Where are you? Do you mind taking the microphone and asking your question? Um, as it's now cheaper than before for genome mapping, should everyone have their genome mapped so that we can give interventions for diseases more earlier? So, what you're saying is now that the genome mapping is cheaper, and it's going to get cheaper, uh, should we all have our genome mapped? Oh, gosh. Um, I, <laughs> Adam, I, I'm going to come to you first. It's inevitable, aren't I? Isn't it really? OK, sorry. I'm, be, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to sound like a bit of a, a, um, a loudmouth in this panel, so I'll, I'll be brief. I'm on the record, uh, the, the public record is saying that I believe that... Um, we sh all people should have should be have their genomes fully read, and it should be part of the National Health Service that they should be read at birth. Now, I say this with many many caveats in place. The main ones being that we have no idea about the societal nor technical issues that go with data privacy and data security, nor do we have the legal framework in place in the slightest bit to deal with the ethical issues that emerge from this amount of very very private and personal data. However, we are infinite in our variety within our genomes. And within our genomes, as was alluded to at the beginning, um, it, within our genomes, there is infinite variation which does encode um, predisposition towards many, all diseases. Also, uh, infinite human variation in our phenotypes, you know, what we look like. Also, hidden in our genome is the entire history of our species and indeed almost every species that's ever existed. So for that reason, we are the data, right? We are the data in this room. Humanity is the data. And from a purely scientific and health-related point of view, yes, the more data we have, the stronger our interventions are going to be, the deeper our knowledge of our own species is going to be. But the caveats are ethical, moral, data security, and i got no idea about any of that. This is going to be, I have to be careful as chairman for this doesn't become... It's very lucky that, you know, the chairman can't speak on this because, of course, I totally disagree with Adam. But, this is, <laughs> so, but we will argue about it some other time. But, Nina, I, I really would like your take on this. It's bound to be uh, an argument between it, medics to a large extent. It's a, ver it's a very interesting one. And what I would say is that this is coming as sure as anything, this is coming. We are all going to... I mean, I have to say, I am on record for saying to my husband that what I would really like as a, as a present is a, is a gorgeous... Uh, maybe diamonds, but I'd settle for less. Um, a, a, a necklet with my genome sequence embedded within it, because it's so cool. I mean, you know, <laughs> this, can be, this can be done today. Isn't it absolutely amazing that this can be done today? It's just fantastic. But as, as Adam says, the problem is we still don't know what to do with the information. So this is still a research arena, um, but it's coming. And one day we will know what to do with this information. We will know how to, to ha handle the, all of the issues that Adam's raised about data security, personal privacy, and also, do we actually want to know certain things? Because we, we, may, we may not. So there's a whole heap of, of issues that needs, there needs to be a public discussion about. Um, some countries have already started to engage in that. Iceland, for example, with their ENCODE um, project. Shelley, have you thought of yourself getting yourself sequenced? No, I haven't. But it does interest me, and I'd, I would do it. I prefer not to know. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think everything we choose to eat every day kind of shapes our destiny in a way. And I don't know, knowing the future is a little bit scary, I think. <laughs> I like to I, more just go with the flow. I was sequenced, actually, for a television programme. And it was simply to see where my origins were. 
and remarkably was done blind, so they didn't know. Well, it was pinpointed to one of three groups in Palestine, which I'm sure is right. So that's quite interesting. I mean, I think for paleontologists, it's, it's an amazing advance. I mean, this has done a huge amount for that area of science. Um, do, you have, do you have views on this? Would it be more expensive? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We need the mic Speak with the microphone quite close to your mouth if you want. Um, would it be more expensive for us to genetically do mapping for an entire population rather than just affording the people who want it done? Would that be more expensive than then waiting for the disease to occur and then treating it that way? Mm. It's, a great, it's a great way of framing the question, no, actually. No, no. Mark Hansen's talked about the interaction with the environment because, of course, one of the problems is the genome does not tell you, Mark, about your interaction with the environment very well, does it? No, that's true. Do you want to just briefly add in a bit of discord <coughs> into the discussion? Yes, th thank you. I suppose I alluded it to it a little in my introduction. I mean, where, now that we know there are so many epigenetic processes that can be affected by the environment, to, to my view, actually, the genome is just such a tiny part of the whole sort of story of, of uh, how the cell develops and unfolds and how phenotypes develop. So I'm not sure that it's going to tell us anything very useful. I mean, the, for example, the, the type 2 diabetes example is a, is a good one. Um, but I might pass the mic actually to Professor Karen Temple, who, after all, <laughs> is head of our uh, <coughs> group on human genetics and actually will probably side with Adam, I think. Well, no, I, I, I think it is a really interesting debate and a great question. Um, I think it depends on the context. And so um, if you are a family where your <coughs> child has got a developmental problem, you may well decide that you want to have your genomes done. Because, in fact, a genetic test can pinpoint the exact cause of a child's developmental problems. So we've got examples of um, people who are on ITU and fitting, and in fact it turned out that they had a gene mutation that meant if they had vitamin B6, they could stop fitting, okay? And that's because we understand the physiology and the mechanism of those, that epileptic fit. So there are really serious reasons why genomics is fantastic. And of course, as we become more personalized, and I love the idea of a personalized di diet for a personalized problem, then um, it may be that we've all got rare diseases so that it will be relevant. But I think it is really important to realize at the moment we don't know how to interpret the genome and we don't know how it interacts with the environment so that if you did have your genome tested, then for a large part we wouldn't know how to uh, tell you really things that we really believed. So it's going to take us a long time. It's like a revolution. It's going to, it's going to be like the Industrial Revolution. We're going to be 100 be. years. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. But, but my, my point is that it's data and the answers are in there, or some answers are in there. And so there are literally thousands of, of very rare diseases which are not studied, and they, they're often not recognised by doctors because they're almost unique, but they are encoded in the genome. Furthermore, um, uh, when Mark at the beginning alluded to that article in Nature, the, the case of the missing heritability, which I helped edit, actually, um, and there is a, there's a danger here that in that exact example that he gave, which is correct, uh, where only 5% or 10% of the heritability <laughs> seen in a particular disease or in any particular trait or disease, um, uh, only a tiny proportion has been identified so far. Now, that makes it sound quite mysterious. It's not mysterious. It's just that so far we have scanned... Um, a very small proportion of genomes. We've looked at uh, common regions, we've looked at variable regions that exist across populations that are easy to identify. And I'm identify. going to, forgive me for interrupting you, it's not because I don't want to hear what you're saying, and I'm sure people do want to hear what you're saying, but I really want to give the last word to a practicing clinician. Mm. And I want to ask you, Nina, whether in fact the knowledge of the genome has actually altered your practice. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. But, but as has already been said. Now, I, I absolutely agree with my colleague here. You know, you, we, we, can, we can now identify problems that, that can be dealt with. 
but those cases are still very, very few and far between. But this is coming fast and furiously, and it's fantastic. It's absolutely great, the, the, the revolution in, in um, the ability to absolutely provide precision medicine. It, it, is, it is coming. But it's well, not here yet, except for a very few individuals. I, I think all of the panellists would agree that the very nature of science is that, um, and that's the only interjection I want to make, the very nature of science is that things which are discovered and developed turn out to have a totally different use from what you expect later on. And very often they have a completely different value that are never rec recognised. Mm. So perhaps we'll leave it there. I think it's a very wonderful question. In fact, so far the questions have all been wonderful. Can I turn to Mary Taylor from Thomas Harder <coughs> College? Uh, Mary, where are you? Can we give you the microphone? Ah, lovely. How does the panel think we draw the line between genetic modifications which improve health and those that give other perceived beneficial traits? Mm -hmm. Now, by beneficial, you mean inverted commas desirable traits? Yes. So you'd like to see everybody with blonde hair? <laughs> so, um, what do you think about the dangers of trying to modify humans or the advantages? Well, is it related to the it genetically is. modified vegetables? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm really them back to food. That's a great start. Science is a little bit beyond me, That's but a, I know genetically it's going we, it's we, going. We, <laughs> We can tamper with gene genetically uh, modified vegetable genes quite well. Vegetables is, I feel, going against nature and what the repercussions are of that. Um, I don't, you know, it's, it's complex. You think it's wrong? Yes. So, going against nature, do you, would you not take an antibiotic if you had a, an infection? I, have, I don't know when I've taken antibiotics last. Like, I, more probiotics. <laughs> antibiotics is against life. Probiotics is for life. I'm all for probiotics. <laughs> um, a lot of the foods I create are full of probiotics, living foods, um, right. fermented stuff. But so. the plants that we are eating, after yeah. all, are genetically modified by humans by constant interbreeding, aren't they? Yeah, some of them, like wheat. And wheat, for example, look at the problem that's causing, the way that's been modified. And apples? Apples, yeah, some of the mainstream apples are modified. That's and why it's oranges. always good to buy local apples from your oranges, yeah. yeah. And, and beans, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this a shopping list? <laughs> <laughs> um, and and, and what, about, what about you? I mean, do you? I mean, do you think... I mean, there's no question, we can now gene insert genes which alter muscle activity, the PEPCK gene, for example. That was done some years ago. You can make mice run mm -hmm. very much faster, not just 5% faster, but a lot, lot faster. Yeah. Um, and at some point in time, we may see humans actually driving, inverted commas, benefit from that. What's your view of that as an, as an athlete? It's all right, that's an area that the anti-doping are trying to work on now because it's not necessarily doping through uh, medicine or um, you know, steroids or the common um, substances that you, you're aware of. It's, it's gene doping and surgery, you know, people having their tendons manipulated, um, you know, hands uh, to make them perform better. And it's a whole area that you can't really um, monitor so effectively because, you know, how can you tell whether someone's had something done with their fingers to make them, you know, perform better in the sports arena? Um, it, it's a very grey area. Um, I believe in, um, you know, doing things to help with your health, uh, but not um, for, you know... Uh, meddling with life just for the sake of meddling with it. So um, you'd edit genes to try to prevent a disease in the family? Yeah, but, n but not for the benefit to make me run much faster. So where would you draw the line? Would you draw the line, I mean, would you do it for colour blinders? Um, if it affected a son, or, or then possibly. Nina, help us out. So I find... There are a bit of illogicality, I think, yes. in this entire debate. Because every time you, you say, well, 
I'm going to marry this person and I'm going to have children with them. And it's because I love things about them. You're in a way saying, this is the person I want to have children with. That is, in a way, you could regard that as genetic manipulation. You could. So I think that, and, and I'm not frightened of genetically engineered foods. Um, uh, uh, what did Mendel do when he did his famous experiments? He was genetically manipulated. So it's done all the time. What do um, people who breed you know, winning horse, horse rate, uh, um, uh, horses, um, what, what are they doing? It's genetic manip manipulation. So now, but what Robert was speaking about, which is gene editing, oh. is taking it that next step further. And of course, science is always pushing at the boundaries. But it seems to me, again, there needs to be a national conversation um, about where we are currently and where we've been in the past with genetic manipulation, because we've all been doing it, um, before we're actually able to face up to discussing the consequences of gene editing, which I think is also coming fast and furiously. Uh, well, Adam, I, I know you'll have very strong... I know you have very strong views mm. on this issue. So let's hear a few of them. Well, I, 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 you know, I think Nina frames it very, very well, actually. It, uh, this is a technology, and technologies can be dual use. The, the, the technology itself is neutral. I think it's very important that we look at these things on a case-by-case basis. About three quarters of an hour ago, a paper was published in which a seven-year-old boy who had, has a condition called epidermolysis bullosa, which is an awful disease where your skin falls off and blisters, um, increases the risk of skin cancer um, and infection and is life-threatening, has been effectively cured by taking his own stem cells, genetically modifying them, and a, a metre square of his own skin genetically modified skin was regrafted onto his body and has effectively cured this disease. Now, this is a sample size of one. This is one example. Um, in that case, I think, um, personally, I find myself uh, in the moral position of asking the question, well, why wouldn't you do that? Right? Now, that is genetic modification in order to improve health. We already have modified the, the germline um, in the case of what is popularly known as three-parent families, they're not really three-parent families, but in those children who are born with their own mitochondria, with their mitochondrial DNA donated from a third party, they have eradicated that disease, a fatal disease, in those families permanently. And again, I ask the question, of why would you not do that? What, what, would your be, what would your moral or ethical justifications for not do, applying that technology if you could? Now, when it comes to the editing of desirable traits. I, you know, this is a tough question. I, I'm going to fall back to a non-moral position and just a technical position, which is we don't know how the genetics of eye colour works. You get taught at GCSE level that there is a gene for blue and a gene for brown eyes. Yes? When it comes to the exam, answer, says, say, put down what it says in the textbook. It is not correct. It is possible for any colour combination of parents eyes to produce any kind of colour combination of children's eyes. There are, uh, so far, most recent study last year, about 15 genes involved in, in um, eye colour determination. We do not know how to change eye colour, even if we could technically do it. Contact so we lenses. are a long... <laughs> what was that? Contact lenses. <laughs> so we're a long way from being even capable of making aesthetic... Um, germline modifications in babies. That's a total deflection from the moral question you're, you're asking there. But I'm honest about it. It's a great answer. Yeah. So um, let's just hear your take on that. Where, where, are, where are you? I've, 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 I've lost you. Yeah, there you are. Do you, do you want to add a corollary or add anything more? Um, well, I don't know. I think that if it was for health purposes, like curing people, I think that it's like a really good thing but I think if it's just you want like you say a different colour eyes or a different hair Fashion. then I don't think that that should be allowed <clears throat> there's a market there's going to be a massive market in having the best possible children in due course somewhere 
market forces might decide that, mightn't they? They already do. Mm. We have public schools. We have fee-paying schools. Yep. We, we already determine people's outcomes, yeah. regardless of their genetic basis. We use fluoride toothpaste strata. too, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The best predictor of, of, of IQ is, um, in, or educational attainment in life is how long you stay in school. Right? And the best predictor of that is how many books your parents have. We make these decisions all the time. Does somebody have their hand up over there, Adam. Um, can, can I? Yes, thank you. Hi. I just wanted to say um, I totally agree with your comments of um, genetically modifying for therapeutics, for example, because you are improving people's lives, but not for what's desirable. But then, again, talking about the color of your eyes, if you have blue eyes, you are more sensible to light than dark eyes. And then there's the question, is this desirable or is it... Do you understand what I want to say? It's not that I don't agree or agree with you. It's, it's really a thin borderline of what's desirable or what we need. And I think that's why it's so hard to, to reply to this question. Do you want well, to comment on that? I, I think we're going to move on yeah. because. <laughs> um, Sorry. Because, because I, in my in my view, if we do start doing gene insertion in the human embryo, which I think we will, at some point, mistakes are inevitable, and of course, mistakes will be irreversible in future generations, and we will not have any control over the personality of those people, for example. And there are all sorts of unpredictable effects, even with perfect gene editing. So I think that's a real issue. Can we turn to Joel, Joel Williams from Thomas Hardy College as well? Uh, Joel, where, where are you? Do you mind seizing the microphone? Uh, hi. Um, <laughs> does the panel think that we are dehumanising the process of having children by insisting on perfectly healthy mothers and fathers? Do you hear that? So let me just repeat the question. Uh, are we dehumanising the process of having children? by insisting on perfectly healthy mothers and fathers. Uh, what, is per what do we mean by perfectly healthy? Well, I don't think there is anything as uh, perfection. That's an interesting question. Um, can I turn that to you, Nina? What, well, no, I was going to say what, uh, what uh, the I think question. my colleague here answered, uh, asked the question perfectly. What is perfectly healthy? Do you want to, do you want to, define, do you want to define the question a bit? Uh, I think it would vary on the scenario that you were having to, that you would be... Uh, so, for example, are you argue, are asking a question about somebody who carries, let's say, some kind of genetic mutation in the family where there's a chance that they might have a child that would carry that mutation? Is that what you're after? Um, are, you, are you suggesting there's a eugenic issue here where... Uh, we would prevent some people who we regard as being incompetent from allowing them to have children? I'm more looking at the aspect of you would have a adult who, or parents who are particularly able in a certain sport or could be particularly intelligent and would therefore you would have those two adults uh, procreate to create a child um, and therefore that would, that you would hope that that would then encourage them, the children to have similar traits and a, is that dehumanising the A process? deeply philosophical question. <laughs> Nina? Well, clearly, clearly not. People should be... When we, it's not done, it would, shouldn't be done. And one of the, one of the great things, of, co of course, about where we've got to as, as human beings is through evolution is because we've constantly mixed <coughs> our, our genes. And out of that mix has come all the wonderful things that, that human beings are today. So I think one would, one would uh, meddle with that at our peril. And this is why I've never understood um, animal breeders who, of course, strive to go down a particular route. route. And it's always seemed to me that they might be missing out on the wonderful diversity that we see in human beings. So I, 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 would, I would applaud diversity in all its myriad ways. So, Sherry, ignoring what goes on behind closed doors at the Olympic Games, do you think uh, athletes... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 do not ignore that. <laughs> talk about that. Oh, yeah, you can talk <laughs> I say something wrong? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think that um, 
athletes should marry each other and have children <laughs> with each other? It's funny you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not married, but I'm with my um, fellow ex-skeleton okay. race, and we've got two girls. Um, it just happens. I, th I don't think you could avoid meeting someone who is in a, uh, the same field. You know, it's like two scientists, you know. Um, you can't avoid two people meeting and making, you know, reprocreating. So, you <laughs> so you don't think you're not worried about dehumanisation because you certainly respect, presumably, certain traits in the family I that you've. I that don't you've think created. you can really avoid it because it's already it's already happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, but on the subject of the Olympic environment, they okay. they do give out. I was all I'd, I'd, okay. they, yes, do, please. they do give out supplies to um, stop that from happening. Yeah. I, I did know that actually. Did you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, it's quite common in they the also press, have isn't it? The most remarkable mass spectroscopy, which uh, <laughs> is used for detecting drugs, and I have some of those instruments which uh -huh. I got from them in my lab, which I use all the time, yeah. looking at very, very small trace molecules. We got yeah. them very cheaply after the Olympic Games. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you think we should uh, dehumanise, do you think we might dehumanise our children if we have particular views about you know, how they should be trained in a particular way or brought up in a particular way? Yeah, I just think it's over-analyzing it. I just let things happen naturally. Why, why, why analyze it so much? Do you have children? No, no, no. I have no time for kids yet. Yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Still a big child myself. Yes. Adam? Well, I, 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 funnily enough, this, this panel is in far too much agreement. This is, you never get this on question time. I actually agree with everything that everyone's said here um, on this, this question, because humans do... That we, in, in evolutionary biology, we call it non-assortative mating. Humans tend to marry within their own social groups, uh, within a few IQ points, within a few inches in height, within the same social structure. This is just how humans behave. So in that sense... This is, this is exactly what humans have always done. We tend to marry alike. But Nina's point is absolutely crucial as well. Over the long term, over evolutionary time, we never stay within our same groups um, for any length of, of, of great time. Humans are really good at two things, which is moving and having sex. Um, and as a result of that, in, the immediate, in our immediate environment, within a few generations, we tend to mate with people who are very similar to us. But over a long period of time, we tend to want to have sex with everyone. We've almost come to... <laughs> <laughs> that, that didn't come out exactly the way... <laughs> this is laughing, isn't that it? It sounded clever in my head. <laughs> we, we've, uh, we've almost come to the end of our hour, but I do, want to, I do want to get one more question in very quickly, if I may, and that is from a fascinating question, and a very important one from Bethany Clifford. Uh, Bethany, where are you? Should anyone be able to become a parent? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know who to start with here. Um, I, I, I mean, I've, 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 I've put Adam a bit on the spot in the past, so why don't I start with you, Adam? <laughs> this is some revenge for something, like some, some slight on your... Not Adam really. <laughs> oh, wow, what a question. You know what? I, I'm, I'm going to dodge it again. I'm going to dodge it because I have personal opinions about this. Um, but as a scientist, it's our job to present factual information so that society can make these decisions in an informed way. What, what I shy away from is ill-informed society-wide discussions. And so it's my job as a science communicator to say, these are the things that we can know, right? And then, and present them, because scientists are part of society, but it is everyone. It's the demos that gets to make these decisions. So, you're, I mean, you'd never get someone saying this on question time because you're required to give an answer on the real question time. But I don't think my answer has a great deal of validity to that question. And therefore, I'm not going to share it. My job uh, is, is to provide good data on which that, that everyone can make informed well, basically decisions. basically refusing to increase your Twitter feed, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, you know, expertise is a highly undervalued thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jamie. Um, I've quite a personal opinion on it, but I don't think if it's appropriate to share it in, you uh, in this. Oh, well, I think you can. I think you can. You, would, would you prevent some people from having children? I think there are certain people or in society them. who shouldn't be allowed to reproduce. <laughs> would, they be, would they be less good chefs or...? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, there, People who put there, too much salt in the food. There's a lot of evil. There's, there is evil in society. Um, Come on, name names. If you get <laughs> don't leave us in suspense. Tell us. Rapists, no, I mean, child abusers. I don't know. There's certain okay. people who should. I mean, be that's a very fair. That's a very fair question. They're, they're breeding into yeah. society, and they don't yeah. have. They're well, not nurturing them as they should. It's very close to the eugenic arguments, of course, of the late 19th century. Um, what do you think? I, <laughs> it's a really hard one to answer, but I share the views of, of both. Um, there are individual cases that you've just got to look at, but there are um, you know, people that aren't necessarily equipped to care for young children. Um, of all of us, Nina, you have the closest interaction mm. with parents and children. Mm. And, I and this must be something that must cross your mind from time to time. Well, it, you're, you're right. It's very close to what, what, a, what a, a neonatologist does in their day-to-day -day life, thinking about these sorts of things. But I would turn the question the other way and say, could one prevent this? Just think of the, 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 the implications of, suppose the answer to your question from my, my colleagues was, no, not everyone should be allowed to be a parent. Could you actually put that... Would you wish to put that into action? I would not. I don't believe many people would. In, because in, think of what it would involve. In, so, um, in, in the United States, which, along with Sweden, had the most aggressive eugenics policy of yeah. the 20th century, around about 75,000 people over the 20th sterilized. century were sterilised, yeah. either involuntarily or with the threat of their welfare being And withdrawn. more recently, in India... The most, um, there, the most was, there was yep. forced, uh, there was forced sterilisation. This was met with abhorrence, and correctly so. So I think that, that that your question, in a way, can't be answered because I think society today would say, the if the answer to that were yes, we would not wish to put into place what the implications would so be. So I, I want to conclude this whole session with a question to you. And in fact, there's two questions. I want a show of hands for those of you who, at least in principle, would, in an ideal society, would want to prevent some people from conceiving on the grounds that they would be bad parents. Could we have a show of hands with people who agree with that statement? Not many of you. <coughs> there wasn't. A, no, I'm not a saying this would be that we're something we would enforce, but simply in principle. Uh, who would actually go so far as to enforce this in a eugenic kind of way? Nobody mm. is really brave enough <laughs> to put their hand up and support the Galtonian... Pro oh, you would, would you? Yeah. I mean... You know, it's a, it is a real issue because even the British courts, as, as, as Adam will tell you, have occasionally, and I've been an expert witness in such a case, where it's a question of whether you sterilised a young woman who might have got pregnant and it was regarded that she'd be so unsuitable for various reasons without going into detail, that in fact the court gave permission for sterilisation to be conducted on the grounds that it might be reversible, actually. And that was the reason why it was agreed to. But are we not talking about different points here? Um, like Jamie said, certain people who are child abusers, rapists, he's not saying such that they may be a bad parent, but then that might continue down generations, as opposed... Hmm. Do you see my Well, point? We, do, we do have a, other mechanisms in our society, mm. I think, don't we? Of well, the people who were sterilised in the States and in Sweden, 
Um, they, they, it ranged from, and I use the terminology of the time, imbeciles and mentally incompetent people, to homosexuals, to poor people, to alcoholics, to people with all sorts of mental health issues. Now, and the, in California, still today, 2010 was the most women recent. coming out of female prisons being yep. sterilised because they would have babies which would be left to the rate payer. That's, that's that, happening that in is, one prison in Northern California that's at correct. the moment. Yeah. California, the most liberal state, of course, the most aggressive adopter of eugenics policy over the 20th century. More people sterilised involuntarily in California than in the rest of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, may I, should I call a halt to this, Mark? Thank you very much indeed for being a fantastic audience and thank you especially for getting up on your feet and asking really wonderful questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time for all of them, but we've got a very good spread. And can I just thank uh, uh, Nina Modi very much on, uh, for really her expertise and Shelley Rubman for your delightful comments as, as an athlete, uh, Jamie Raffery as, uh, as, as, as a master chef, and of course um, Adam Rutherford. Thank you very much, panel. There's always one exception. One, one last thing I have to do, folks. Sorry, Robert had to rush. He has a must get back to town. He told me he hadn't, on the subject of food, Jamie, he said he hadn't had a hot meal for four days. So he's certainly been on the road. So uh, I wasn't sure anything you could lash up in the time would help him out of that one. Um, great pleasure to actually announce the winners of the prizes. And actually, it's just as well that Robert's gone, because I happen to know he's an Arsenal supporter. Uh, <laughs> and these are prizes from Saints, uh, our local team, of course. Um, and you can collect the prizes, I think, from reception, or if through our reception's closed, we'll make sure we get them to you. So, the in no particular order, Rohan Chilau, you've got a Saints shirt. I gather it's been signed. Whether it's been washed, I don't know. <laughs> Carly Rye Broadway, you've got, I think, two tickets to their match against Everton. <laughs> <clears throat> Not sure if that's home or, home or away. Hope, hopefully it's home. And Daniel John, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, also two tickets to that match. So, well done. <clears throat> And then lastly, I'll hand over to our Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research, uh, Mark Spearing, to close the event. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thank you to uh, everyone who's participated in a fantastic day today to celebrate the 10th or the 10-plus Delta uh, anniversary of the uh, Institute for Developmental Sciences. I'd like to repeat the thanks from the chair to our panel, Adam, Jamie, Shelley, Nina, and... Uh, the now absent chair, uh, Lord Winston. Uh, really challenging and vibrant discussion, and it's not easy to do it as, as well as you have. So many thanks to that. I'd like to just um, issue the disclaimer to any confusion caused over A-level or GCSE genetics questions by Adam. Um, there is only one answer, and it is genetic. <laughs> And one gene. Um, and above all, to thank you, our audience, for participating in a really excellent discussion. And we look forward to a similar celebration in uh, the next 10 years of IDS's con contribution. So thank you all. Have a really good evening. <laughs>